In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we are offered the opportunity to think on eternal things, to maybe look beyond the here and now and what might bind us to the world and to focus instead on God's purpose for us. We'll begin with the Old Testament passage. We have this excerpt from the book of the prophet Samuel. And this excerpt is coming at the end of Samuel's time as prophet to the people of Israel. The people of Israel are asking for a worldly king. And they want this king so that they can be like other nations. Samuel, of course, is horrified. They're not just rejecting the leadership of the prophets and priests and spiritual people who connected them to God and God's purpose for them as the chosen people, but they were rejecting God as their king. They were suggesting that they needed an earthly figure, someone who could lead them into battle, someone who could rule over them and make decisions on their behalf to make it a bit easier for them in no longer having to discern the will of God, which was always a challenge. And God's response to this, Samuel was expecting something different, probably, no, you don't need that, don't forget about me, you know, God, I'm the only king that you need. No, instead, issue a warning to these people about what it will be like for them to live in the ways of the world instead of in my ways, but then allow it to happen and remind them that it is their choice, not mine. Well, we could see in the Old Testament how that played out. Of course, those of us who might not be familiar with that part of the passages could anticipate that exactly as God had foretold, the kings that ruled over them at times were very human and they suffered because of it. A very, very hard lesson to learn that looking to God's purposes for us as God's people is always going to be better than looking for a worldly purpose that we can ascertain for ourselves and gain control over. Here we can see that the, the human need for feeling in control actually does the opposite for this group of people in the ancient world. Now that's a pretty good place for us to then delve into the psalm because the psalmist is celebrating the fact that if we do rest on God's purposes for us, then God's loving kindness will put us in good stead. We'll be protected from enemies. There will always be justice with God. Maybe not in the way that we want it, but in the way that is actually best for us. Now that's pretty tricky because as the Israelites had expressed in this passage from Samuel, we just explored, it's hard to discern the will of God. What is the will of God for each and every one of us individually? But what is the will of God for each of us in community? Now that's the part where we're going to jump into the gospel passage for today because we meet Jesus when his popularity as a healer is beginning to spread, where people are starting to talk about him and share the news that there's someone who can cast out demons. And of course, these remarkable events that happened around Jesus drew not only those who were really excited about it and really wanted to see it happening and maybe even take advantage of it if they had a, a person in their life that they wanted healed, but there were also the others who were suspicious. How could this be? Surely Jesus is doing this not in the right way with God's power, but somehow linked to Satan and suggesting that that is how this power has come to be. Whether they really believed that or whether they were just scared of the influence that Jesus was beginning to have in communities, well, that's a matter of perspective. But what we know is the way that Jesus responded. He made it very clear to suggest that he was doing this in the powers of evil doesn't make any sense. 
if a house is divided, it will fall. And then he goes on to suggest, actually, that is my purpose. You can't go into a house to wreak havoc there unless you tie up the strong man. And that's exactly what Jesus' mission was, to go into the house of evil, to tie up Satan and to take away his power forever. Now, there's a lot of little nuances there. Maybe the crowds didn't quite understand what he was saying. But maybe what happened next was something which even more affirmed that Jesus had come from God, was completely united with God, and was acting in God's purpose for all of creation, not just for Jesus' life as a human, as well as God. And this thing that happened might be quite hard for us to understand. His family, having heard about his fame, having also heard about the things that were said negatively about him and the fear of the leaders of the time, had come to try and take him away. Now, they weren't trying to silence him. They were trying to save his life because they knew only too well what happens when all of the political leaders of the day, and especially the Romans, had some sort of focus or attention on someone who was speaking out. They knew that that didn't lead to a good place. So his mother, his brothers, and we're here, also his sisters, they came in a great group to try and extract him from this dangerous position that he was in. And how does Jesus respond? He responds by saying, well, who are my mother and my brother and my sisters? And he looks around him at those who had gathered, those who had recognized his godly presence and said that they were his family. Now we might think, wow, that's really tough on, on Mary and his actual blood siblings. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And in the ancient world, it's true. It doesn't make sense because family unity and family loyalty was the most important thing for a person's identity in Second Temple Judaism, the time that Jesus was living. So for him to basically say, no, I'm not going to be obedient to them, but my obedience and the obedience of those around me to God is what creates a new family. We are following not in the worldly systems like family units and blood ties, but we are following in the eternal membership of God's family, which lasts beyond the context that we are born into, which lasts beyond our sufferings and which puts us into a place of true life and truth and light. Okay, so how, how do we then apply this lesson to us? So Paul can really help us with the epistle today. He's writing to the Corinthians yet again, this is his second letter to them, to remind them not to be focused on the sufferings of now or the troubles of now, but rather to look to the eternal things. Not to focus on the things that can be seen, the tangible, the things that we can measure and that we humans might think we have some influence or control over, but rather to live into the eternity that we are given in the invisible things, the spiritual things. And Paul does recognize that this doesn't bring easy life here and now, but he does recognize that we mustn't lose heart and that our joy can be found in discerning the will of God and doing it and giving obedience not to the worldly earthly things that can draw on us very strongly, but rather to set our sights on God, to set our sights on, on what living as God's children in God's family means and how we can give not only our obedience, but our devotion and our very selves and our identity into that eternal promise of Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to ditch our family and, and go on the road and all of a sudden become amazing evangelists and preachers. Maybe that does happen for some. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have a workplace where we have to engage with others who might not necessarily think the same as us. 
it doesn't mean that we are not going to have those moments where we go, hang on, I really don't know what would be the holy or godly or, or Christian response in this situation. I'm not sure. Doesn't mean any of that. But what it means is that our focus and possibly our intention for our lives can be given fully into the hands of our God who wants good things for us and wants our eternal selves, that eternal part that each of us has, our essence that will live on beyond our context, to be nourished, to be nurtured, and to be ready to meet Jesus when he comes in glory. Good news is we don't have to do that alone. And that's what's so beautiful about Jesus' assertion that belonging in the family of God is about obedience to God. Maybe sometimes in situations where we seem to be against the world, but living things out in our lives with God's purpose at our heart and our best effort to discern that and discerning that together as the family of God can really put us in good stead. So I'm gonna end with the final verse of the Psalm. I'll say it first as it's written, and then I'll say it again as a short prayer for each and every one of us. Because this verse really sums it up for us. The Lord will complete his purpose for me. Your loving kindness, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your own hands. Now is a prayer for each and every one of us. If you'd like to close your eyes, feel welcome to do that. The Lord will complete God's purposes for us. Your loving kindness, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake us, the work of your hands. Show us the way that we may go to live in eternal ways, nourish our eternal selves, and draw from you and not from the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.